Be good to go. Did it turn into a square? Okay. As, as someone famous once said, it's hip to be square. Okay. I know it's not a good Baptist song. Yeah, so, okay. Well, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, that we are going to be looking these next four weeks at the theme is Ascending Mount Carmel, which is one of many images, ways of thinking of advancing in the spiritual life in a particular way. So we're not going to get through everything in four weeks, but the idea is to wherever you may be on that ascension in the spiritual life, whether it's just beginning or maybe a little bit more advanced, is to, to offer some insights and some thoughts um, and a little bit direction of how we actually go about in advancing and moving forward and closer to God ultimately. So the first step, as always, in moving closer to God is to do so with that step of prayer. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Pour forth your Spirit, O Lord, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the goals... Uh, in these weeks, too, is to keep to the the timeline of six to seven o'clock. Um, so, which means I'll probably get I'll probably wrap up about seven o two, but I, I do want to keep to that. Also, respecting your all's time and knowing we're not going, I'm not going to touch everything, and not even everything that I want to and hope to. For each night. Um, but there is just a step in faith that I hope and presume that calling upon the Holy Spirit that he will make sure we get to what he is wanting from this time. So the first, so this is a beginning and, and on the back side of the sheet I gave you I do have the topics for the four weeks. Anyway. So the idea is overall arch and movement is Beginning that introduction, how do we answer the question of what is Carmelite spirituality, what is unique to Carmelite spirituality, and then what does that mean for our daily lives? How does that play itself out? What are the ways, how do we actually bring that into life at work, at home, with the grandkids, uh, wherever it may be, um, to begin taking those first steps? As I kind of mentioned earlier, and one of the ways that the Carmelite rule begins, so if you ever wondered, I didn't bring the rule of Benedict, it makes a very good contrast. So the rule of Benedict is going to be something like this size. This is the Carmelite rule. And the first half is introduction. So half of this is the Carmelite rule. Um, they actually have someone wrote out, and there is an artwork that's about this tall, a, a cross, this tall, this wide, that is the entire Carmelite rule, and it's legible enough you can read it on a single sheet on that. But it starts out saying, many and varied are the ways. Talking about many and varied are the ways to our Lord to that reunion with him. But you have come to me for this particular way. So it recognizes that when we look at those who have progressed far and well in their spiritual life, okay, it is not the Carmelite way alone. This is why we have the Benedictines. This is why the, the Dominicans, the Franciscans. Okay that there's, we all have a resonance and a personality in the spiritual life and as we do amongst ourselves. And God is so wonderful and loving to us, he tries to seek out and say, okay, what are the language, what are the words, what is the way that are going to lead you closer to him and draw you what resonates and works with you spiritually? In the prayer life, we don't all pray the same. And that gives one example of the differences. And I was just talking in a regular conversation 
if if a priest can actually just have a regular conversation uh, with someone over the weekend and talking about the prayer life and they came up about okay benedictines okay they see their work as prayer so and and work prayer is work it's a job that you do it's a task not as a negative thing not like going to work in cubicle world in dc you know as a bill collector it's not supposed to be laborious in the doldrums of life but it is work which if we remember our first or second grade science definition of what work is it's a task that is done for a specific purpose and so the benedictine way approaches prayer as a task that is for the particular purpose of coming and drawing closer to God, of speaking with Him, of worshiping Him, of praising Him. And it's within kind of that sense, the analogy is work. That's what they do for the day, and it's a good and best work. Okay. Dominicans, prayer is study. It's coming to know God through study and scripture and the written word. Okay. For Franciscans, and this is the conversation we actually had, Franciscans, the prayer life is, and God is kind of just out there wandering around. Okay, we have jokes too. We're funny, but but there's a reality. There's a reality that you can just wander around amongst creation without an intentionality to it. But if your intentionality is your heart on God, that you will find Him and be in union with Him. Franciscans have a very their their focus is apps, and they all have a way of interpreting poverty. But for insistence that poverty is what really draws and enters them in towards God. Okay. So for Carmel, the question becomes, okay, what if that is true, what is Carmel? And that's why we have four weeks to talk about it. And the way I wanted to share this, so in short, I'm sure each of you is probably familiar with at least one of the Carmelite saints very likely. But we see it is, so how would you react actually if I say, the epitome of Carmel is Elijah, the prophet. That is the Carmelite of all Carmelites. He is actually the one that is credited and named as the founder of the Carmelite order. And this isn't just a, a joke that we make amongst Dominicans and others. This, um, and we'll talk a little bit just briefly about this later. Um, this is uh, the book of the first monks that traces the history of the order beginning from Elijah to Elisha who inherited from him all the way down through Mary. Mary was the first Carmelite in Jesus' time okay. to modern day Carmel. So what does that mean about what Carmelite spirituality is? There is a deep personal love and relationship. The part of Elijah's life that I think is the epitome of marking this is in the cave. When he retreats to the cave. And it's not an easy journey, it's a hard journey. It's one that at one point he's even crying out for death. There's a real purgation, a real separation from the world. And that God had to bring him to that point to then invite him into the cave. He had to literally flee from the world to the greatest extent, to the, final, the last point of his life. And then he says, get up and go. And he goes into the cave and he waits. And there's a beautiful painting that shows him at the opening of the cave. And we know the scripture story. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. And there is that still, small voice. And he goes to the front of the cave and he hides his face. And he speaks with God. The very dear, intimate conversation of friendship and being fully in God's presence. Okay. That's an image of Carmelite spirituality and how we get there. So rather than just sticking with 
John and Therese and Teresa, who are loved most dearly, we can pull this out by looking at the different ways. And one of the ways of seeing the different Carmelite saints, and they have some very different imagery that they use. But it is the same journey, it's the same path, just put into different words. Okay. So, um, for instance, Teresa of Avila, the interior castle, moving through the chambers, and as you get closer and closer, you experience a greater union with God, and he dwells in the center. Okay. Or John of the Cross, the ascension of Mount Carmel, or the dark night of the soul. That purgation that happens in secret in a quiet place. And that burning, that living flame of love that cleanses the soul of all the imperfections of all those things that would draw us away from God so that he can sit and he can rest on the breast of the one whom he loves. And then Therese of Lisieux, that beautiful image of her standing at the bottom of the stairs just reaching up for her father the total surrender that I do not do anything, but it is God our Father who lifts us up and carries us and draws us toward him and embraces us. Okay. What they describe, and each of these Carmelites saints describe, is the very same way, the very same path, just from a little different perspective. And I think that is because we all see from different perspectives a different point of view. So that through that also different language, there's one that can really kind of hit and strike you and that makes more sense to you than the others on that. Okay. So all of that by way of a brief introduction without actually giving you an answer, what does make Carmelite spirituality unique and what are the necessary essential elements? Okay. So try not to peek ahead at, at the bottom of the sheet because to get there what I want to do is, okay, these are, some, these are the books and some of them I want to just pull out a few things from okay, to lead us and we can help kind of see what Carmel is and how, what that way of ascending the mountain of God is. As I mentioned earlier, talk about the book of the first monks, and this was the novitiate manual for a few centuries. So every novice got a copy of this when they entered, and it was reading, and it traces the spiritual history from Elijah all the way through. And what it describes, and it says that the goal of this life is twofold. To offer God a pure and holy heart, free from all stain of sin. And when it says this, it says that in the context of this first work, this offering God a pure and holy heart is something that we do. It's our actions. It's, what, it's the work of our hands, our job, our task. It's entirely up to us what we offer to God. So we find those things in this life that helps to purify our heart. We avoid those things which we would say Sully the heart. We separate ourselves from the impurities, those things that would taint. So the first fold reason, way, purpose is accomplished by the work of our hands and our souls. And then the second goal of this life is to taste somewhat in the heart and to experience in the mind the power of the divine presence and the sweetness of heavenly glory, not only after death, but already in this mortal life. I think this is a promise that God gave us that after the Reformation, we lost. Not just the Protestants, but a lot of Catholics, I think, still too have lost this promise. That you're saying it's not just wait until life after death. The rich man, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Be righteous, follow the law, the commandments of Moses. He said, yes, I do that. Good. That's not easy to do. 
You have to be a good and righteous man, truly, to live up and fulfill the law in that. But all right, says, Jesus says, nope, there's more. Give up all that you own and follow me. Do you see the difference in those two, that twofold command, those two questions? In the beginning, he's like, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus gives him a response also that says, don't wait until the eternal life. Don't wait until tomorrow. You can be with me now. Follow me. Be in my presence now. This is his desire. This is one of those two, that goal of the Carmelite life is in using Therese's words. I want it all. And her impatience. I don't want it all tomorrow. I want it all now. As soon as I'm ready for it, give it to me. Okay. To Elijah, that line, I am feel, I am zealous with zeal for the Lord. Zelosalatus, that's part of the Carmelite shield. And you probably haven't thought of cloistered sisters or monks as filled with zealous with zeal and that craziness that we see from the stories of Elijah. If you have, raise your hand, because that's... But it's zealous for what? With zeal for the Lord, that nothing can get in our way, nothing can stop us to pull away, to detach anything that holds me back from a closer relationship and loving God, to be able to passionately say, no, get that away from me that our vision is only filled with Him and Him alone. Okay. If you know something about the history of the Carmelite order, the first thing is founded on Mount Carmel. So it is also the only religious order or Christian order that is named in the Bible. So that way we get, a, we get a leg up. So founded on Mount Carmel near the spring of Elijah. Okay. And what, where this came from, and this is where I got to be very careful not to spend 30 minutes, is during the Crusades, as pilgrims would go down from Europe down to the Holy Land, either to Many of them were the soldiers going to free up the Holy Land again to reopen the ways of the pilgrim routes so pilgrims could again see the holy sites. And those who would be traveling along, they saw this group of monks that were worshiping up on a cave near the spring of Elijah. And some of them stopped and stayed there. Now the first group, the first monks that were there, what we pieced together from history and what becomes pretty confident in was actually a group of Eastern monks, not Roman Catholic monks, that they had up and at some point long before had settled in the Wadi. And the Europeans, as they come, they said, I, I need a break from the world. So they gathered around the spring of Elijah to pray, and this is who became the brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. That's, even today, that's the official name. That's the full name. Like Fitz Hall, we just call them Carmelites. Fitz Hall is Fitzgerald Hall. We shorten it. After, and they believe Fourth Crusade is when Sulah Hadin finally took control and expelled, I think it was the fourth rather than the third, and expelled them from Mount Carmel, wiped them out, drove them out. Okay. That, um, and where they fled to Europe. And in settling in Europe, they faced a new dilemma, a new problem, because the desert. Part of the way of life was pulling back, retreating. 
going into the silence. Big difference between Mount Carmel and the streets of Paris or London, even in the 13th century. And there are a lot of questions about how does this way of life fit now when we're away from our namesake into the cities. And after a couple hundred years, there was a call because they started losing their way of life and felt like they were getting lax and lazy. So a gentleman named Nicholas the Frenchman wrote this book, a letter entitled Ignis Agita, The Flaming Arrow. And in that, towards the beginning, he says, now let us apply our minds to a close scrutiny of what it, being our form of life, to find out whether our salvation demands that we live in the desert or in the city. So a big part of the Carmelite experience was saying, can this be done in the city? Or does it demand us physically to be in the desert? And what he calls, and this is still one of the preeminent literary works of the Carmelite life and spirituality that the order turns to. So the first would be the rule, Second would be the book of the first monks. Third would be the flaming arrow. And again, using that imagery of the flame not burning as a sense of killing and destroying, but that arrow that is fired into the heart to inflame it with the love of the Holy Spirit and the love of God to reinvigorate because what Nicholas the Frenchman saw was that the Carmelites were becoming apathetic and very lazy in their life, and the effects of that. The rule itself says that one is to abstain from meat. Not every Friday, not every Wednesday, not for, through Lent. One is to abstain from meat, period. And they weren't doing that. They weren't spending their time in Scripture. They were always busy going out, and Carmelites became known primarily for funerals and preaching at funerals. That is how they paid the bills at their monasteries. Because they understood if the union, if we don't have to wait until death for union with God, if we can experience that in this life, and someone who knows that, who the all better to share that reality with people after someone passes. They know the promises of God and have experienced and lived it. So the distractions of the world pull us away from setting God as our target. And the ideas of purgation of cutting yourself off, so still being in the world. And we can imagine that the conclusion to this question scrutiny, can we live in cities or must we live in the desert? Carmelites continue to dwell in the cities. So it's a way of life that requires the foundation of the desert because we need that starting point. We need that establishment. There are times when we need to pull back to the desert, but it's not reserved to the desert alone. It is finding and growing into that so you can have the desert, that union with God, that separation from everything that distracts, no matter where you are. But it takes work, it takes intentionality. It doesn't just happen with ease. Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection does anyone know, recall what his, and not you two, sorry, what his, I guess, main phrase is, or the title of his main book, his main work is? And I said not them because I, I know that I, I, I've spoken it to him. I may have phrased the question in a confusing way, but. Here, have you ever heard of the practice of the presence of God? That comes from Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. 
That idea of God is even is present in the pots and the pans. That in everything we do in every moment of God, the Creator is in all things and pervades all things. And all of this exists because He sustains it. If anything is separated from God completely, it ceases to exist. So if that's the case, then no matter what the situation is, no matter what we're doing, if we can be attuned more to His presence in that, then there is nothing but joy in life. But one of the other things he said he wrote is, throw yourself headlong into God's infinite mercy. There is a part of the Carmelite life, a beginning point of humility, of utter, utter helplessness. That we cannot climb the mountain alone. Again, going back to that life being twofold, one aspect is by our work, the other aspect is entirely God's doing and entirely His work. So throw yourself headlong into His love, into His desire for you. That leap and that jump of faith. Don't let anything hold you back. And again, if anything is holding you back, is weighing on you, is saying, no, I'd really want to, to do some penance and to fast for others, but not my coffee. Then what, what Brother Lawrence would say and the Carmelite would say is, that means you need to give up coffee. That means you need to give up ice cream. If there's anything that you feel like, oh, I want to give this up, but I can't, say, as soon as we say can't, that points the way. I'm not talking about for survival. I'm talking about your desires, the things that pleasure, the things that would keep you from giving fully and zealously to God. So throw yourself headlong into God's infinite mercy. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. Another Carmelite. May, May is a good month for Carmelites too. She is one very, very interestingly, did not actually write anything herself. The, this book that I compared in size to, to the Rule of Benedict is a collection of, and it says, Selected Revelations. So what she was known for is entering into long periods and one even lasting 40 days of ecstasies. And during these ecstasies, she would speak. So the novices, they gathered the novices around to write down what she was speaking and what she was saying. How much more humble can you be as a writer having to let someone else write for you. Not even to remember what happened afterward. To craft it. And what she, what they described and what she did and spoke of at times was a dialogue with the persons of the Holy Trinity. So there would be times when she was dialoguing and speaking with Jesus. There are times when she was speaking directly with the Father. And other times directly with the Holy Spirit in these times of ecstasies. And an ecstasy is a moment when all of the faculties are suspended because our presence has been ripped and pulled into the immediate presence of God. If you can imagine what that would be like to fully come, finally come in and see in that beatific vision, we would just be, think, imagine be standing in awe, unable to speak, unable to talk, but the Spirit is outside. And it's the work of God that does this. Okay. And what she experienced, Teresa also talks about, and I, I think I've mentioned this in a homily or two. One of the differences between this life and the next life is Teresa says in the next life, we will experience the Holy Trinity simultaneously. In one moment, 
we will be able to experience the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the fullness. But in this life, it's one at a time. That's all we can handle. That's all the soul and the spirit can handle. And we see in Teresa, her writings are filled with the beloved as if Jesus was closest to her heart. And filled with that language. John of the Cross, the living flame of love, that searing, that, that fire that is both beautiful and painful at the same time the Holy Spirit that he had that intimate love and relationship with. Therese of Lisieux, the little way, the little flower that always looked and called God Papa, the Father. So particularly strong, and this is present in the other orders, but would say a foundational point for Carmelite spirituality is it is Trinitarian. And knowing that that Holy Trinity wants to reveal himself to each of us and to speak with us, to be in conversation. Michael of St. Augustine. We finally get back to a smaller piece of work. Life in and for Mary to be in and for Jesus. Describes a way and other titles are translated as the Mary form life. That by conform conformation to Mary, we become conformed to Jesus. Remembering that the Carmelites are the brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. So seeing that, in, that relationship of brotherhood with her. Okay. And he writes at one point just very clearly and simply that it's love reaches God with and through Mary. So Carmelite life and spirituality first and foremost would say is a Marian life. A devotion to Mary above and beyond the other orders. And I think we can see this um, by the gift of John of St. Samson. How many who has a, scap uh, a scapular on now? Okay. Who has a scapular other than the brown scapular on now? Down, down, down to one. How many of you know, okay, pop quiz. How many formally recognized scapulars do we presently have in the tradition and practice of the church today? Ch ch chances are you're going to be wrong, so just give out an answer. There, there's no pressure. One, three, two, one, ten, seven. Jim's closest. If this was Price is Right, come on down. You did not go over. Okay? Sometimes my brain gets confused on the number, so it's 12 or 13. Okay. And the scapulars come from a connection, so this, the scapular is what Mary placed on John of Sam Samson, the brown full. The Dominicans have one also. Wearing a scapular placed over the shoulders, is a sign of belonging to Mary. And the way the small ones developed was because those who are not in the order but around the order wanted to share. The Trinitarians have a scapular. Um, now I brought this up, but my brain is... I, uh, there's a scapular of the Holy Trinity, uh, the scapular of the Precious Blood, the scapular of St. Joseph, they all came from this desire to be associated with the order for, as, as a lay person. But out of all of those, what's the one that people think of first and have? The brown scapular, the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. 
we are Mary's order. And the, the promise is associated with that, that she will not allow the flames of hell, that one, one who dies wearing the scapular shall not taste the flames of hell through the devotion to her. Okay. But it's not that she is the Savior. As Michael of St. Augustine, his work says, life in and for Mary to be in and for Jesus, of knowing that through her we find our way to Jesus and have no greater help than that. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, from what I understand and believe, so I'm putting that just little possibility that I may be wrong. There's, there's a limit to my authority on this. When it comes to the approved Marian apparitions, she is the only one that has appeared in multiple occasions. So in the terms of Our Lady Guadalupe appeared multiple times, but there was one occasion, such and at Fatima and at Lourdes. Okay. But appearing in the form of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, she appeared at Fatima and also to John of St. Samson. Okay. None of the other apparitions or images of Mary actually transcended different cultures and times. So there, there is, that just tells me there is something special. The, this next piece I could have chosen from many of, many of our Carmelite saints, but taking from Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity. She writes, the kingdom of God is within you, which we know scripture said that. And scripture says that the kingdom of God is within you. Elizabeth continues on and says, He reveals to us that we do not have to go out of ourselves to find him. Have you ever heard of the Carmelite life described as the interior life? Teresa's in the interior castle. In the poem, The Dark Night of the Soul, John of the Cross has a line, In night when all was silent, I went up by the secret way. And he tells us the secret way, all is silent and all is still, is a state of prayer. That my soul, that my senses, all is quiet and still in a time of contemplation. I went by the secret way that is unseen, ascending in that interior life that the body doesn't actually ascend and move, but the spirit does in that. That we don't actually have to go out and find God. The reason we go to the desert isn't because God physically is there, but it's because the world's not there. The distractions aren't there. The noise is not there. To hear that still, small voice I'm very tempted to give my, my Superman homily here. Um, I think that's the first homily I gave that Ray Lynn commented on. So, uh, There's a show several years ago called Smallville. And this was about, this puts Superman in the context of when he was in high school and how his powers would have come in to play and he's just growing and the struggles of a teenager just in high school, but also, if you can imagine, one day um, waking up and, you know, jumping, but you don't jump three feet, you jump 20 feet high. You know. Or you take a step to walk and all of a sudden you're going, you're running 300 miles per hour. Okay, through a wall. Okay. When his hearing is coming in, it's driving him insane because he can't control it. All of a sudden he can hear the tiniest of sounds from across town. And you can imagine how deafening that could be. And it, and it was, it was just torturesome. So what does his father do? He takes him into the barn and starts turning on every 
piece of machinery and equipment, the table saw, the truck, the generator, everything. Can you imagine that? Sound is hurting your ears, just the tiniest sound, so your loving dad turns everything on. Painful, hurtful. And then he stands on the other side amidst all of that noise. Can you hear me, Clark? Focus on my voice. Focus. Can you hear me, Clark? He whispers that tiny voice because in doing that, all the more harder Clark had to focus and give his attention on that. Okay. Not written by a Carmelite, maybe. I still think it would have been. Okay. But in the midst of the busyness, we lose track of that sound. So we go into the desert. For most of us, that's what we have to do. And when we become stronger and more trained, then it's focus on that. So again, part of Carmel is you do not have to go out of ourselves to find God in that revelation. Teresa, also when she talks about, does her exposition of the Our Father includes thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, on earth the kingdom coming into me and dwelling inside of me. Edith Stein, who wrote The Science of the Cross. And Edith Stein can kind of tell you she was a Jew. And some would even describe her kind of as an atheistic Jew. She got into philosophy in the 20th century. She was always driven by this desire to know what the truth is. What is truth? Pilate's ancient question. Okay. And it was not until she was handed the work of, Ther of John of the Cross, she stayed up all night, read it, the next morning said, this is truth. And she found Christ through the cross. And to call it the science of the cross, how much does that say to our world today that wants to pit science and faith against each other to say the cross is very scientific, that means it's, there's a methodical nature to it. There's a natural nature to it. That again, we can go back to what I just said about that image of you know, turning on all of the noisy equipment and causing that pain in order to get to the focus. That there is a natural redemptive quality of suffering, of hardship which he comes to the conclusion of salvation could only come through the cross and science and logic and reasoning tells us this and confirms this. Just like Thomas Aquinas says that you can come to the conclusion that there is a God by reason alone. If you think logically, rationally, there is only one conclusion, and that is there is a God, and he loves us. Reason tells us that salvation could come through no other way than the cross. So if we are on this road to salvation, all of the elements that were present in the cross must be present in our life also. Christ himself said, you must take up your cross and follow me. There is no other way to follow him. Okay. And that does come with suffering, with hardship, but not fruitless suffering. It's suffering for a purpose. What is it for? The salvation of others, the redemption of others. There is a very before I get to this last one here, a couple of honorable mentions too. Elizabeth 
of the Trinity. I'm sorry, not an honorable mention because she was already mentioned. A Carmelite Pope. Who was the Carmelite Pope? I have his book in my hand. So really, truly existed. We have him up in our main sanctuary. John Paul II. He, he was a third order Carmelite. Okay. Faith, according to St. John of the Cross, is his dissertation. And the reason I bring him up in that idea of suffering and the redemption is if any of you are familiar with John Paul II's teaching, particularly for the elderly, the infirm, those who are homebound or suffering from long illness. Okay. And this I became familiar with when I was working with the Little Sisters of the Poor in Cincinnati because they had pamphlets with all of his quotes to give out for the residents there. What he talked about is all of the pain and the suffering that is being wasted rather than offered in prayer. So part of the Carmelite life is embracing the suffering because it can have a twofold purpose. Okay. The first is, as John Paul II said, is this is for the redemption of others, particularly if there is someone who is away from the faith and fallen away. Just as Christ died on the cross for the sinners to draw and redeem those who had fallen away, so our pain and suffering can be offered for those who have fallen away for our intention. And the reason why, why are there so many people who can now spend years in hospice and can't even get out of bed? They say, why the long suffering? Why, why won't God just let them go? Why won't they let them die? Because they're wasting their time here. They're doing nothing. John Paul II says they're not wasting time. God has actually chosen and said, I want you, your work's not done. It's that work of prayer. That their prayers are so invaluable. He's saying, I want to give you this opportunity to give this great gift to the world. So yes, linger on for weeks, for months, because in all that time you are offering some of the most effective prayers that the world needs. So the first effect of the suffering, that twofold purpose, is for the redemption of others. The second is for our own purgation. It is a result of our own impurities being burned out. Okay, the same effects of purgatory. So rather, instead of waiting until the end, let me experience God now. Purgatory prepares us to go from this life to the next life. So let me do my purgatory now. Okay. And the thing about it is, if there is impurities in any material, when they are burned out, when they are taken out, when they are cut out, it hurts. It's not a, suffering is not a punishment from God. It is the natural effect of becoming holy. And those parts that our souls may still want to cling on in, on to, and God loves us so much that He will rip us, rip it out of us, not at a point that will destroy us. And John of the Cross talks about why is it a process? Why doesn't He just purify? Why didn't He purify me on the day of my baptism, or even on the day of confirmation as a college student when I said I want, I love the Lord, I give my life to Him? Why did it still take years? Because if you take a piece of wood that is almost entirely dead and still has a little bit of green in it and you burn off all of the dead, you destroy the whole 
peace in whatever life was still there. This is John of the Cross's imagery. But if you had, take a log that is mostly green and you burn out the dead parts, you bring greater life. God is intimate. He knows, how, in a sense, how much we can take. And we may think it's too much. But he wants to purge us ultimately from all of the parts that are dead in us, from all of those impurities, from all those things that make us less human. There is also a phrase, so perfection, the way of perfection is essential to the Carmelite life. But in case I am, can be accused of being partial and always siding with the Carmelites, it's not a Carmelite image. It's not an invention or creation of the Carmelites. Teresa of Jesus, who wrote The Way of Perfection, and I think people tend to think of her as the origin of The Way of Perfection and using that language, this was way before her. So this is where I do the plug for the Advent series. The Book of Steps, the Syriac Liber Gaudium, a work of third century Christendom, the author is anonymous, describes two ways. A path of righteousness, the rich man before meeting Christ, and the path of perfection, the path that the rich man denied in denying to follow Christ, that Christ came to open up for us the way of perfection. Righteousness is that I'm good. Perfection is that all that I do is for your good. That self-emptying of me and myself. So, and this was how the Christian community saw the spiritual life from the very beginning. Many writings, not just the one, talked about the life of a Christian as the life of perfection. Not that we are perfect. You don't start the way of perfection because you're perfect. It's the way that leads to perfection. So that if we travel and we go on it, this is what lies at the end. To be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. The other, because the point to that was not to describe perfection as quintessentially Carmelite, but there's also one that shows up that I recall seeing it in Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection and John of the Cross and Teresa of Jesus, I think in Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity as well, and there are some other places. The idea of you tricked me, Lord, you duped me. Here I thought I was following you, that I was chasing you. John of the Cross talks about the passive night of the soul. That we spend that first time, the first period of the night, thinking that we have to go and find God. That he is something that we attain. If I just act rightly and correctly and I pray right, and I mark all of these boxes... That if I haven't, don't have God perfectly in my life, that means there's something I am, am wrong, that I did wrong. If I'm not feeling that consolation, that great joy and peace during adoration, if I'm not in a state of ecstasy or almost ecstasy, then I have done wrong. That's where we begin this life. Again, righteousness is what I can do then we realize you duped me because it was not me who was chasing you, but you have been chasing me. That our God sent his son into the world. He didn't say, tell us you have to climb the mountain. Moses had to climb up to go. Jesus descended to come to be within us. Remember the kingdom of heaven is already within you. You don't have to go outside of yourself to find God. So in one sentence, 
if I can do this correctly or accurately, what is Carmelite spirituality? The pursuit of the one who pursues us so that we can experience the perfect intimacy of the Holy Trinity. Don't ask me to repeat that. Uh, you can check the video when I get it up on through the My Parish app here. Um, hope probably be late tomorrow or Wednesday. But I do want to just touch and go through these things, and I think we are going to hit about 702. I think I, I think I was right on that. But at the bottom, thinking about what are the essential characteristics of Carmelite spirituality. So to know what is essential to the way and the aspects that set it in a sense apart in the different emphases from the others is one, a relationship with the Holy Trinity, very explicitly with the Holy Trinity. Say Dominicans, it would be a relationship with the Word of God and Scripture. Franciscans, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Carmelites would say, here's another, I want it all. I don't know. Holy Spirit, not enough for me. Father, not enough for me. Son, not enough for me. I want you all. Okay. So it's relationship with the Holy Trinity. It is an intimate union with the Beloved. We could say it is the way of perfection that leads us to there. And perfection being being able to love perfectly as our Heavenly Father loves. When we say perfection, that's what we mean. To love perfectly. It is finding God in the silence of the soul, which is the hidden way. Silence is essential to prayer and finding God. It's not just something that some people prefer. A degree, a measure of silence is essential. It is recognizing the presence of God. Being able to say thank you to God in every circumstance for everything. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that these shoes are a little bit too small. And it feels like it cuts into my little toe. And a truly heartfelt. Thank you, God that I lost my keys and had to spend 20 minutes trying to find them in a 10 by 10 room. Thank you, Lord, that the printer is not working. It's not just thanking him. And, and if we even don't feel at times starting that practice of thanking him for everything, even the hardest things, because and Lord, Brother Lawrence talks about this, because then when you can truly thank him, for the worst aspects of your life, what you see or think are the worst, then you have truly found the presence of God. Because He is there, not just in the clean pots and pans, but He's in the pots and pans that had cheese sauce baking on them for four hours. That I am pulling from my, my past life. Detachment from worldly things. We often hear the language of attachment and detachment. Detachment being, yes, things happen in the world and I notice them. Yes, I enjoy my cup of coffee, but if I don't have it, I'm also okay. I'm not thinking all day and struggling. Oh, I, why am I having a bad day? Well, I didn't have my cup of coffee. Okay. Or I didn't get, why did I have a bad year? Because I didn't get the ashes on Ash Wednesday. 
There is a group of people that that is what they believe and think very strongly. A strong attachment to Ashes on Ash Wednesday. It is, it's a thing of the world that is meant to lead us to God. But it's to detach of worldly things so that our eyes can be purely on the divine. Carmelite spirituality is inflamed in love. Again, zealous with zeal for the Lord. And it is the love of God that creates that flame. It is suffering for the cross. It is not easy, it is not comfortable, and it specifically has to be uncomfortable. And it is a purgation of the things of the world. So next week, th this was a broad overview, and I think I hit a lot of the different tendrils. And the reason I, I recommend and good to have the Carmelite tradition, if you've given a quick perusal, you can see, or just a quick look at the table of contents, this draws from, it includes a summary of, and then excerpts of works of many of the saints of Carmel. It's an introduction to many of them. So a beautiful starting point. Um, some that you may have not heard. No. Okay. So next week, narrow it down. So looking at the three primary ways and what people think of and images of the spiritual life and the ascent of Mount Carmel is the way of perfection. So it's perfection, the ascent, and the little way. So looking more at Teresa of Jesus, the way of perfection, what that looks like, how John of the Cross describes the ascent of Mount Carmel, his philosophy that's been built into that. Okay. And then the little way of Therese of Lisieux. And hopefully too, not just seeing those individually, but also how, even though it's described in a different way, it is the same way. It's the same God, the same relationship that they discuss and show just in different words and with a different person of the Trinity. Okay, uh, two, one or two questions. If That, that, that's what that's what we Carmelites say. Is it true that her uh, ancestors were led by Mount Carmel and were there to store uh, people? That I do not know. I, I've, um, so I, I just have to just simply say. I'm not familiar with that, so I can't say, I'm not going to say either way. But it sounds good to me. Okay. Thank you all very much. We'll conclude. And I realize I should have, I should have prepared and could teach you all to sing the Flos Carmeli. But uh, we will as a parish in August, we're going to start singing that, so there'll be practice. But um, let me pull out. So I will just close by praying part of the translation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Flower of Carmel, tall vine blossom laden, splendor of heaven, child bearing yet maiden, none equals thee. Mother so tender, whom no man didst know, on Carmel's children thy favors bestow, star of the sea. Strong stem of Jesse, who bore one bright flower, 
be ever near us, and guard us each hour who serve thee here. Purest of lilies, that flowers among thorns, bring help to the true heart that in weakness turns and trusts in thee. Hail, gate of heaven, with glory now crowned, bring us to safety where thy Son is found, true joy to see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much. Yes, if you want to.